Let me introduce you guys to Colony. This is a bike park under I-5 in Seattle, and it has huge potential. But today, I'm going to be telling you what's wrong with it and what they need to fix. So first things first, let's go over some details about I-5 Colony. First of all, this is the only urban bike park in the United States. That's a really cool feature, and that's another reason why I think it has really great potential. I-5 Colonnade does have a few major problems that need to be fixed, as well as some minor ones. This bike park opened in the early 2000s and was maintained by Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance. This is the same company that owns parks like Doofy Hill, and they do a really good job at that. This park, however, I think they've sort of abandoned or left it hanging. Even on a rainy day, Doofy still gets a lot of people. Look at this train. This was on a cloudy day, and this is how many people are on Flying Squirrel. Compared to I-5 Colonnade, no one goes there. When we went, it was perfectly sunny out, and it was even midday, and there was not a single person there. The reason for that is definitely that this park is not rideable, and that's the first major problem. All the technical lines here have been covered in some sort of ivy, and the landings to the drops. There's also so much trash around here that some of the features aren't even rideable. One benefit that this bike park has though is that it has a lot of wooden features. All these features have held up over the years and they all seem pretty sturdy. But going back to the fact of this bike park not being rideable, I'd say actually only about half of it's not rideable. Some of the drops toward the main parking lot are really covered in ivy and they should be fixed. There's also a bunch of dust on them so it'll make it very slippery to riders. Meanwhile, some of the skinnies and other paths are very rideable. Currently, I would not go here just because there's a lot of homeless people and trash. The homeless issue is the next thing I'll talk about. If you look around in this clip, you can see that towards the top of that big wooden chute, there's a few homeless tents. Also on the main jump of the jump line, there's a homeless person living right under it. Also on some of the technical features and even the technical line, there's a few homeless people living in bushes. So going back to the issue of some of the park not being rideable, I'll tell you the layout and what you can ride and what you can't ride. I-5 Colonnade has two valleys and then there's one peak at the middle. This drop right here is at that peak and you can see how it's closer to the bridge than the rest of it. There's also a slanted angle so that some of the features lower down like the roller coasters are way closer to the bridge. On the farthest side from the entrance, there's a few drops but they're all covered in ivy. They go into a few bowls and then you can go back into the fire road where you can connect to a bunch of your other trails. Right next to the drops, there's also a wall ride which is pretty cool and then there's a steep chute leading into it. Right next to it is where the jump line is. This has some pretty cool jumps and also some pretty cool wooden landings. These are actually two jump lines, but they're pretty similar. Next to the jump lines, there's also another steep chute with a nice cool rock berm. Moving down the hill, you have your roller coasters, which are also really cool. They have a medium sized one and then they have a big one with steep drop offs. After these, you converge into a central area that leads you back up to the jumps. Of everything that Colonnade has, this is probably the feature that I'm most jealous about, just because Doofy only has one good one. Moving up and out of the first valley a little bit, you come to a few wooden little drop-offs, and then there's another cool wall ride. At the top of the hill, where it's not slanted at all, there's a few really cool skinnies that you can practice on. This is also where the start of one of the jump lines is. So now you're at the peak of the valley, and here there's only a few drops, just because you can't really fit that much in when you're that close to the bridge. Towards the bottom, there's just a few more skinnies, and then a few little wooden rollers. Something that I find interesting about Colonnade's layout is that the skinnies and wooden features are just kind of scattered. I think that's an interesting way, but it kind of makes sense. So now if you're walking through this, you'll be on the downside of the second valley, which just has a few more wooden features. And then there's actually one really cool trail. This is pretty much like boot camp's downhill section, although all the berms are either made of wood or cobblestone. On the top of the angle where it's closest to the bridge, you have your cross country loop, which I think they call the limestone loop. This is very mellow, and all it is is a few skinnies, which are all optional, and then a gravel climb with switchbacks to the top. There's a lot of these sorts of rocks and cages, and these help support the actual trail from erosion. The limestone loop also has a few really cool features, such as this wobbly bridge right here, and even a few teeter-totters. On the left side of the limestone loop, you have one double black diamond rock roll, which is almost vertical. I wouldn't consider this double black diamond, but maybe if I rode it, it would actually be harder. The last area you'll find right next to the limestone loop, and that's the beginner skills area. 
On the posts for the bridge, you can actually see information about them, and I think these signs are all pretty cool. This one says they're the Pacific Tree Frog, and these are the little rollers. It tells you the techniques on how to hit them, which can be useful for beginners, and then it tells you about the Pacific Tree Frog. So now we're done with layout. I know that was a lot to cover, so I'll draw a quick map for you, and then I'll tell you what the bike park needs to fix and how they can get it up and running again. Here's that map. So we'll start on the side by the parking lot. Right next to that, I'll draw the hills first. These are so you can see the valleys and where each thing is. First is the drops. There are four of them and they come off into a one open bowl that leads back into the road that connects with everything. Then you have the jump lines which are in the center. These are two of them and then right up top there's some skinnies and then at the bottom there's some roller coasters. Right at the top there's also a few drops but they're not on this map. On the other side of the second hill you have the limestone loop and then the beginner area. That's pretty much all there is, and it's not as confusing as it may seem when I was talking about it. This map makes it look pretty easy, and now I'm just going to label it, so I'll fast forward through that. So it's not that confusing, right? This map is pretty much just a more detailed version, but it's basically the same as the other one. I didn't draw the valleys and hills in this one, but you can imagine where they are based on the other map. So going back to what they should fix about this bike park, I think first they need to fix their major problems. This includes kicking out the homeless people and then doing the re-landscaping and picking up all the trash. As I said earlier, this bike park is maintained by Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance and they tend to do a pretty good job maintaining trails. I think in order to get all the homeless people out, they need to have people ride this place constantly because then they won't want to be here. If there's a lot of people riding here, then that'll be good because more people will come because it's more attractive and also the homeless people will leave because of the constant noise. When I say noise, you might be wondering, well this bike park's under a bridge, so what do you mean noise? When I say noise, I mean the general clutter of riders here and then also conjugating and talking. So the next step after helping the homeless and picking up trash is definitely to fix the rideability. Most of the wooden features are still intact, but this would include fixing some of the jumps lips and then also making the dirt a little bit better. This could be by watering it or just having many other ways to make it better. Once they do this, honestly the bike park's pretty much ready to ride. As long as they clear out all the ivy from the drops landings and then make everything smooth and ready to ride, it'll be a really decent park. It has so much potential and wooden features that people would love it if they fixed it. Since it is the only urban bike park, I think a lot of people would really like to come here and it would get crowds. If Evergreen fixes it up, it would be tons of fun. So I'm done talking for this week's video and I'll see you all next week.